Christianity is superior to Judaism. I'm going to show you today in the scriptures, New Testament, King James Bible, the greatest book that's ever been printed. And I'm going to show you from the scriptures today um, that Christianity is superior to the modern and even the ancient system of Judaism. And I'm going to be going exclusively, staying in exclusively, I should stay, say, in the book of Hebrews. This is not an anti-Semitic rant or something else, not at all. Um, I'm going to be reading from the Apostle Paul. I believe he was the author of the book of Hebrews. And he's a Jew writing to Jews, to other Hebrews. And I believe specifically that this book is doctrinally pointed towards Jews in the time of Jacob's trouble. So we're heading in that direction. So I thought it'd be good to kind of straighten a few things out with Jewish people and help them to see that... Um, that their system that they currently have is inferior to Christianity. And Christianity, by the way, is a Jewish religion. It is not a Gentile religion. Gentiles kind of, uh, you know, we're here and things. I do believe that there are still some saved Jews in the world. But the vast majority of Christians today are Gentile. But it was started out by Jews. All right, it's very important to understand that. But I'm going to really spend some time in the Scriptures today and let the Scriptures speak. All right, I'll give you a little bit of my commentary as we go through it, but I'm going to stick mostly with what the uh, scriptures are saying. So we're, we'll start out here in Hebrews chapter 8, um, verse 1. <clears throat> now of the things which we have spoken, this is the sum. We have such an high priest who is set on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens, a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle which the Lord pitched and not man. Okay, so Jesus Christ is my high priest. What do you have if you're a Jew? Some wicked sinner down here, kind of like the Catholics have. Oh, we have the Pope. Oh, another sinner. Uh, no, I have a perfect man, the Lord Jesus Christ. God manifest in the flesh. Okay. Uh, verse 3. For every high priest is ordained to offer gifts and sacrifices. Wherefore, it is of necessity that this man have somewhat also to offer. For if he were on earth, he should not be a priest, seeing that there are priests that offer gifts according to the law who serve under the example and shadow of heavenly things, as Moses was admonished of God when he was about to make the tabernacle. For see, saith he, that thou make all things according to the pattern showed to thee in the mount. But now hath he obtained a more excellent ministry, by how much also he is the mediator of a better covenant, which was established upon better promises. Now it's a whole big study, but Jesus did not bring in the new covenant. Jesus brought in the New Testament. Hebrews chapter 9. We'll get to that here in a little bit. He didn't bring in the new covenant yet. The new covenant is coming yet in the future. But it is a better covenant, which is established upon better promises. You have better things to look forward to if you become a Christian. right? That's what you get today. If you miss the getting saved in the church age and you go into the time of Jacob's trouble, then you can be a saint in the time of Jacob's trouble, but it's going to be a lot more difficult. But you will have the signs then to confirm the word. But let's continue here. Uh, verse 7. For if that first covenant had been faultless, then should no place have been sought for the second. For finding fault with them, he saith, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, because they continued not in my covenant, and I regarded them not, saith the Lord. See, that's the condition of Judaism right now. They are not right with God. They rejected God, manifest in the flesh. They said, oh, he's just Jesus. He's just some troublemaking, whatever. No, he was God manifest in the flesh. And he is still God manifest in the flesh. Okay, it's very important to understand that. They rejected the Lord. They kept disobeying. And finally, the Lord said, okay, I have to step back. You just go and do your own thing. And then you get dispersed. I'm going to scatter you throughout all nations. Kick you out of the land that I promised to you. But he brings them back. Okay, very important to understand that. Uh, verse 10. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their mind and write them in their hearts. And I will be to them a God and they shall be to me a people. And they shall not teach every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for all shall know me, from the least to the greatest. For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness, and their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. And that he saith a new covenant, he hath made the first old. 
Now that which decayeth and waxeth old is ready to vanish away. Um, and <clears throat> certainly they're trying to cling to some aspects of the old covenant. It's kind of funny because if you actually study the Torah and whatever else, I don't know of any Jews that are actually keeping it. Doing the animal sacrifices and the other things, you know, the Levitical laws and whatever else. I don't know of any Jews out there that are doing that. So it's already gone. You know, they're trying to bring it back. Well, we have the red heifers and whatever else. You're not going to bring it back to the way it once was. And uh, it's funny, too, because if you study the issue in the time of Jacob's trouble, there are two witnesses that come back, Moses and Elijah. And they're prophesying against the nation of Israel. Because the nation of Israel is filled with a whole lot of mingled people. The Bible says, that's why the Bible says that they're not all, of, they're not all Israel, which are of Israel. And I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say that they are Jews and are not, but do lie. Okay, Revelation 2.9, Revelation 3.9 talks about the synagogue of Satan. People faking that they are Jews. Um, I've you know, had a couple of Jews get sarcastic with me or professing Jews, and I simply say, what tribe are you part of? Can you trace your ancestry back to a certain tribe? Because if you can, okay, then I believe you're a Jew. If you say, well... You know, we go over to here and we go over to there and we're intermingled with this European group or with this Hamitic group or this or that. You're not a Jew, okay? I mean, uh, the uh, descendants of Ishmael, those people, the Arabic people or whatever else you want to call them, the, uh, are they considered Jews? They have Abraham as their father. They're not considered Jews, though. It's important to remember that. Um, Hebrews chapter 9, let's continue here. Then verily the first covenant had also ordinances of divine service and a worldly sanctuary. For there was a tabernacle made, the first wherein was the candlestick and the table and the showbread, which is called the sanctuary. And after the second veil, the tabernacle, which is called the holiest of all, which had the golden censer and the ark of the covenant overlaid round about with gold, wherein was the golden rod that had manna, or golden pot that had manna, and Aaron's rod that budded, and the tables of the covenant. And over it the cherubims of glory shadowing the mercy seat, of which we cannot now speak particularly. Now when these things were thus ordained, the priests went always into the first tabernacle, accomplishing the service of God. But on into the second went the high priest, alone once every year, not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the errors of the people. Had to do it every year. Kind of interesting, just like Roman Catholicism. See, Ahab, representing the Jews, taught Jezebel. How to do things. And then Jezebel, this woman, she hides this leaven in three measures of meal. I talked about that in my whole study on the thing of the Ahab and Jezebel. Very deep stuff. Lost people don't you know, understand all that, but you can watch it if you want to on this channel here. Just look up the, just type in on my channel, search thing, Ahab and Jezebel, and you'll see the studies on it. Um, Verse 8, the Holy Ghost, this signifying that the way into the holiest of all was not, yet made, was not yet made manifest, while as the first tabernacle was yet standing, which was a figure for the time then present, in which were offered both gifts and sacrifices that could not make him that did the service perfect as pertaining to the conscience. See, it's inferior to what we have today. I, as a Christian, I can go before the throne of God in heaven, and my high, high priest is up in heaven, the mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. He's my mediator. And I can tell him my you know, things and my struggles and ask for his help on things. And he hears me and he answers my prayers. I'm part of his body too. So, hmm, a lot better than what you had back there in the Old Testament. Uh, and I can be made perfect in the sense of his righteousness is imputed to me. That's a whole other thing. Verse 10, which stood only in meats and drinks and divers washings and carnal ordinances imposed on them until the time of Reformation. Uh, if you have a new version, it says until the time of the new, uh, new order or new world order. Uh, some of those ones are very highly satanic, but <laughs> that's what you get when you get uh, Bible versions made by the Vatican and other heretics. Verse 11, But Christ being come and high priest of good things to come, by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. For if the blood of bulls and of goats and the ashes of an heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctifieth to the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit 
offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience, conscience from dead works to serve the living God. Purge your conscience from uh, dead works. Hmm. All the little services and all the little things that you do there, you know, in Judaism, you go and you, you go to the, white, the wall there, which is not the temple. That's not the foundation for the temple. It's a foundation for Fort Antonia. The temple, the last one, was in the city of David. That's not the city of David. The Mosque of Omar there, the Dome on the Rock and all that, it's not where the temple's supposed to be built. They might build it there, but uh, they'll be worshiping the Antichrist in that place. But, um, <clears throat> you know, all these little things that they do, the dead works and everything, the little Orthodox Jews with the curly Q things here and the special hat that you have to wear and the special way that you dress and the, the things that you do and, the, you know, you're praying your prayers and whatever. Dead works. That's all that it is. God's not impressed. Verse 15. And for this cause, he is the mediator of the New Testament, that by means of death for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the first testament, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. We're in the New Testament. We're not in the New Covenant. That comes when Jesus Christ physically comes down to the earth at the second coming. He brings that in when he brings in his millennial kingdom. Please understand the difference. And a lot of these new versions, again, the Vatican versions, the NIV, NASB, ESV, a lot of those types, I can't say which one it is in particular, but if you study it, you look into it, they will actually replace New Testament with New Covenant, which is a complete lie. It's terrible that they do that. But let's get back to the text here, verse 16. For where a testament is, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator. For a testament is of force after men are dead, otherwise it is of no strength at all while the testator liveth. So again, please understand, this is a very foundational passage of scripture hebrews chapter 9 verses 15 through 17 because it tells you when the new testament began the new testament does not begin in matthew chapter 1 it begins with the death of the testator so you look at matthew chapter 27 to chapter 21 going back through that's all old testament that's all happening during the old testament so you see matthew chapter 24 you say it's for christians no it's for jews in the time of jacob's trouble you read it, you compare what's going on to the Pauline epistles, 1 Corinthians 15, Ephesians chapter 1, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16 through 18, talking about the resurrection of the body of Christ. It is not the same thing as Matthew chapter 24. You have to get that. You have to understand that. Most people don't. But you see, the death of the testator is what brings in the New Testament. So the Gospels are primarily talking about things that happened in the Old Testament. Right, right there it is. Not my opinion, not my feelings. Okay, you have to rightly divide the word of truth. Very important. You're con to consent to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ. Paul wrote that in 1 Timothy chapter 6. So you don't just ignore the Gospels. No, there's things in there where Jesus is foreshadowing what's going to happen today in the church age. There's a lot of really good things there. Um, you see, you don't just erase everything that happened in the Gospels. No, you don't do that either. That's hyper-dispensationalism. But you have to rightly divide and say, okay, the Gospels are leading up to my salvation when I get saved. But there are things, certain things that are happening that are not pointed directly at me. That's why in Matthew chapter 24, it warns about things happening on the Sabbath day. Pray that your flight be not in the winter, neither on the Sabbath day. Romans 13 verse 9, there isn't any mention of the Sabbath day, having us, us having to keep the Sabbath day. Um, Matthew chapter 24, let them which be in Judea. Okay, it's written to the Jews in Israel. All right, it's not written to Christians. So anybody that goes to Matthew chapter 24 to tell you that you're going through something in the future, you know that they're lying to you. All right, well, let's continue. Matthew chapter, or yeah, Matthew. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 18. Whereupon neither the first testament was dedicated without blood. For when Moses had spoken every precept to all the people according to the law, he took the blood of calves and of goats with water and scarlet wool and hyssop and sprinkled both the book and all the people, saying, This is the blood of the testament which God hath enjoined unto you. Moreover, he sprinkled with blood both the tabernacle and all the vessels of the ministry. And almost all things are by the law purged with blood, and without shedding of blood is no remission. It was therefore necessary that the patterns of things in the heavens should be purified with these, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For Christ is not entered into the holy places uh, made with hands, which are the figures of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. 
nor yet that he should offer himself often as the high priest entereth into the holy place, place every year with blood of others. Okay, now let me just stop there real quickly too. You say, well, Jesus, if he's you know, God, why would it say he's entered into the presence of God? Because it's talking about God the Father. All right? The Son of God is Jesus Christ. God the Father there is in heaven. You say, well, I thought you said that they're the same. It's just one God and they're the same. Yeah, it's called the Godhead doctrine. The Father is the soul. Jesus Christ is the body. That's how it has to work out. Man is made in the similitude of God, after the similitude of God. I'm created in God's image. Okay, I have a body, a soul, and a spirit. God has a body, a soul, and a spirit. There aren't three persons in God. I don't have three persons. If there are three persons in God, then the Bible's a lie. Because there's three persons there, and I'm made in His image, that means I have to have three persons too. Or as well. And I don't. Okay? Be a lot more people to feed. But get more stuff done, though, if I had two other persons. But <laughs> it doesn't work that way. Okay, the Trinity, again, the Trinity whole thing, it comes from philosophy, according to the Catholic Catechism. That's where it came from. It's, there's no word Trinity in your King James Bible. But let's continue. Verse 25. Nor yet that he should offer himself often, as the high priest entereth into the holy place every year with blood of others. For then must he often have suffered since the, since the foundation of the world. But now once in the end of the world hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. All right. Jesus Christ died on the cross. He willingly died on the cross. The Jews conspired with the Romans, I believe starting the fifth kingdom that was prophesied in the book of Daniel. And they conspired against God manifest in the flesh, the Lord Jesus Christ. They put him to death. His blood was shed to pay for sins. Anyone's sins out there. The Bible says, whosoever will, okay? Um, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. It's available right there. The blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanseth us from all sin. Again, Acts chapter 20, verse 28. The, the feed the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. Understand the difference there, right? Jesus Christ is different than the Father. I'm not saying that Jesus is not the Son of God. He's God the Father. I wouldn't say that. That's, that would be stupid. It's two different titles in Scripture. But it's for the same being. But there's separation in the sense of body and soul. And the Holy Ghost is the Spirit. So there's three parts to God. There are three parts to man. If you're not saved, you're not going to understand this. You'll just call me a heretic and I'm lost and whatever else. And this is some kind of terrible thing and I'm denying the Trinity. When the Trinity is not even in Scripture. The word Trinity. There's a lot of things to study here. If you're new to, to uh, Bible-believing Christianity. But verse 27, And as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment. There's no reincarnation, in other words. So Christ was, was once offered to bear the sins of many, and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. All right? And I, you say, well, wait a second. You said earlier that Moses and Elijah you know, would be the two witnesses. Well, then that means that he would die twice. But it, the, verse 27 says it's appointed unto men once to die. Oh, you have a contradiction. No, I don't have a contradiction because it's an appointment. God makes it a general appointment, a general statement there. It's appointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment. All right? and there are, but there are exceptions to that rule where God steps in and intervenes and says, okay, I'm going to make an exception here. Lazarus, think about it. Um, our friend Lazarus is dead. Okay, and yet Jesus goes and they say, oh, you know, don't go over to the grave. He says, you know, open the grave. Well, no, he's been in there for three days. Uh, you know, don't go in there and, and take the stone away. And our friend Lazarus is, is not dead. He's just sleeping. Lazarus, come forth. Well, Lazarus died. He was physically dead. He, but he comes back to life. Did he die again? Yeah, he died again. So don't tell me that Moses can't, you know, he died in the Old Testament. And then he'll come back in the future. And, and then he couldn't die or something because it's only, he can only die one time to avoid contradicting Hebrews 9. Chapter 9, verse 27. No, no. It's appointed unto men once to die. That's what the scripture is saying there. So that verse is debunking the whole reincarnation thing that the New Agers and uh, what is it, the Hindus, I guess, believe. Um, that completely destroys their, their whole thing. God appoints man to die once. 
But if God wants to change that appointment and say, okay, Lazarus, you're going to be raised from the dead and die again. Moses, you're going to die way back in the Old Testament and then come back to walk around the streets of Israel and Jerusalem and to show signs and wonders. Elijah, Elijah didn't die. He was called up to heaven, but Moses did. God set an appointment, though, to say, okay, I'm going to let you die twice. But let's continue here. Uh, Hebrews chapter 10. And we'll read this chapter yet, and then that'll be it for the study. But there's a lot of very important things here. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 1. For the law having a shadow of good things to come, and not the very image of the things, can never with those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually make the comers thereunto perfect. For then would they not have ceased to be offered, because that the worshippers once purged should have no, had no more conscience of sins. But in those sacrifices there is a remembrance again made of sins every year. So it's just a continual thing that you have in Judaism. There's no perfect sacrifice to take away your sins. It's, you know, and again, the Jews aren't even sacrificing animals right now. They're trying to get to that point where they can bring that back with the whole red heifer thing. But they, they don't have any kind of way to purge their sins. I mean, it must be a pretty rough and, and terrible way to live, just knowing that there's no atonement for your sins. You have to just basically be like a Roman Catholic or something. You, may, you might not partake in the Eucharist, but you just have to be kind of a, a do-gooder. Maybe, hopefully, I can eventually get there. I think maybe, you know, what a terrible way to live. <laughs> Absolutely horrible. Jesus died for my sins on the cross one time. And that's it. That's all that needed to be done. I called upon the name of the Lord. I believe the scriptures. I call upon the name of the Lord to be saved. He looks down. He sees my condition. He says, you know, he goes through everything with, in my mind, understands I'm not just faking it. I really do want to be saved. I really do believe his word. I trust by faith that Jesus died on the cross to pay for my sins, that his blood's enough to wash away my sins. And the Lord says, okay, I'll save you. And he did. And I'm born again. And you'll never talk me out of it. You know, write all the comments you want to about, well, actually, Christianity is it. I have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. He changed my life. And he's been there for me all these years. The scriptures are alive to me in my King James Bible. I don't care what your little Hebrew and Greek manuscripts say, and it should better. Actually, the King James has errors in it. And I, I, I've lived this book. And I love the Savior that this book tells me about. And I don't just say, I can create my own image of Jesus Christ and I don't need the Bible. Uh, no. I understand my Savior, Jesus Christ, through His perfect Word. But let's continue. Verse 4, For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sins. Oh, the red heifer. Oh, look what the great red heifer. It's not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sins. Sacrifice all the red heifers you want to. It won't take your sins away. I know you're getting ready for the Antichrist thing and all that other stuff so you can worship Satan and try to bring in your Jewish utopia, one world, new world order thing and whatever else with all the Rothschild money scheming and all the other, you know, uh, things that have been done down through the years with, you know, Philip Schaff and uh, all the guys that have been involved in the, you know, the finance and banking and Hollywood and all the other things that the wrath of God is coming upon the Jewish people for. Absolutely terrible. Verse 5, Wherefore, when he cometh into the world, he saith, Sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not, but a body hast thou prepared me. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, thou hast had no pleasure. You think it's going to bring God pleasure when he sees them sacrificing a red heifer down there? Oh, that's a shame. <laughs> Not gonna, oh, wow. Oh. Because he knows where it's heading. They're going to set up the Antichrist in, his, in their rebuilt temple in the future and worship him. Verse 7, Then said I, Lo, I come in the volume of the book it is written of me to do thy will, O God. Above when he said, Sacrifice and offering and burnt offerings and offering for sin thou wouldest not, neither hadst pleasure therein, which are offered by the law. Then said he, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. He taketh away the first, that he may establish the second. By the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all, doesn't work for Catholics either because they have to continually sacrifice Jesus, you know, and then they actually eat his flesh and drink his blood, you know, with the Eucharist and transubstantiation through the magical Latin or, hey, you can use English now too, I guess, 
and then the, the wafer and the wine becomes the flesh and the blood of Jesus, and you have to go and practice cannibalism in order to have Christ in you. That's what they teach. I'm not making that up. I've proved that in many studies. Verse 11, And every priest standeth daily, ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. Don't tell me that Judaism is better than what I've got. Don't try to even think about converting me to your nonsense. It's not happening. <laughs> but this man, talking about Jesus Christ, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God, from henceforth expecting till his enemies be made his footstool. Jesus Christ is ruling this earth for 1,000 years. It's called the premillennial coming of Jesus Christ. Not a bunch of wicked, Christ-rejecting people, be they Jews or Catholics or a combination of the two. Not happening. For by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. I am sanctified. All right? I am. I don't have to be sanctified like the Vatican versions like to say. I'm being saved. I'm being sanctified. Uh, no. I am saved. I am sanctified. Verse 15, wherefore or whereof the Holy Ghost also is a witness to us, for after that he had said before, this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, after the time of Jacob's trouble, in other words, saith the Lord, I will put my laws into their hearts and in their minds will I write them, and their sins and iniquities will I no remember no more. Now where remission of these is, there is no more offering for sin. Be a good time. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the Holy holiest by the blood of Jesus, the God's blood that was shed there. Jesus is God. Don't give me this nonsense in the comments section. Well, there's no scriptures that say that Jesus is God. There are so many scriptures. You have to be blind to not see them. Oh, you know, lost, in other words. Verse 20. By a new and living way, which he hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, his flesh, and having an high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works. All right? This is written from a Jew perspective, Paul, to Hebrews out in the future. He's trying to say this. You can relate to a lot of the things if you read the book of Hebrews. I can't. I'm a Gentile. I don't have any Jewish blood in me. Again, I, I showed the video. You can look it up on this channel here um, about my ancestry or whatever else. I'm not a Jew. And um, my sister, my older sister, had a uh, genealogy test done or whatever, the DNA test thing and whatever, and it, we are 100% European. It's just the way that it is. My wife is the same. Uh, a lot of people try to say, oh, we're, everybody's mingled. No, uh, that's not true. Sorry, but look at verse 25. Now think of the context here, what we've been going through. A Jew, Paul, writing to Hebrews in the future time of Jacob's trouble. Verse 25, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much the more as ye see the day approaching. Uh, how can you apply that to Christians? I mean, maybe instruction in righteousness, it's good to assemble with other Christians. Fine, yeah, sure. But uh, it doesn't work. It doesn't say, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together in church buildings. It doesn't say that. And it says ourselves together. It doesn't say, invite the lost in, we're having a special Christmas cantata, we're having a special evangelistic revival meeting, week of revival meetings or something. It doesn't say anything of the kind. Let's get lost and saved to come together used to always irritate me, you know, and uh, singing, you know, in, in Sunday uh, church. I remember when I used to go, I'd, I've been in church all my life, you know, different types of churches and things. Protestant. I was never Catholic. Praise the Lord. But uh, you know, they're singing and, you know, and I'd remember I'd see people that would bring their lost relatives and I'd look over at them and, you know, we're turn to hymn number 392 or something, you know, and what can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. I'm looking over at them and they're singing it. And I'm thinking, that's not true. Your sin is still there. You didn't, you don't believe in Jesus. Oh, but they're singing, you know, the hymn sings so they don't want to stand there and be quiet. What an abomination these church buildings are. 
saved and lost coming together. Then the lost eventually take over, which most of those church buildings are run by lost people now. But it's not what God intended. Um, you know, and exhorting one another, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as ye see the day approaching. What's the day approaching? Well, that would be the second coming in context here. Jews in the time of Jacob's trouble. Hebrews in the time of Jacob's trouble. It doesn't have anything to do with a Christian. We're not looking for the day approaching. And then you get into some more stuff for the saints in the time of Jacob's trouble. Verse 26, For if we sin willfully after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation which shall devour the adversaries. Every person that denies eternal security, once saved, always saved, as they say, for a Christian today, they all go to Hebrews chapter 20, or Hebrews chapter 10, verse 26 through 27. Every single time. And it's so funny because I've talked with them face to face with charismatic charismatic nuts, and I always they always go to this. If we sin willfully after we receive the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins. I say, okay, have you sinned willfully after you get saved? Well, yeah, I mean, yes, uh, you know, or if they say no, yeah, right, okay, have you done this, have you done, well, okay, yeah, then you've sinned willfully after you received the knowledge of the truth. Yes. Did you get resaved? They say, yes, I did. It's not what it says. There remaineth no more sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful looking for a judgment and fiery indignation which shall devour the adversaries. You're lying about the text. What? No, and it was just your interpretation, and yeah, no, it's plain English. Okay, this is not written to a Christian today that's sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. It's written to a Jew in the time of Jacob's trouble that if they come out and take the mark of the beast, that it doesn't matter what your profession was. See, in the time of Jacob's trouble, it's faith and works. There's an element of works there. You can't take the mark of the beast, worship him or, or his image. Okay, if you do, you lose whatever profession of faith that you had. Not that hard. Verse 28. He that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses. Of how much sore punishment suppose ye shall, be, shall he be thought worthy who hath trodden underfoot the Son of God and hath counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing and hath done despite under the Spirit of grace. For we know him that, set, that hath said, Vengeance belongeth unto me, I will recompense, saith the Lord. And again the Lord shall judge his people. Talking about the covenant that he made with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and their descendants. The whole point of the future time of Jacob's trouble is the Lord judging his people. It's not for the church, the body of Christ. Verse 31. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Very true if you are a, a uh, lost Jew right now. But call to remembrance the former days in which, after ye were illuminated, ye endured a great fight of afflictions, partly whilst ye were made a gazing stock both by reproaches and afflictions, and partly whilst ye became companions of them that were so used. For ye had compassion of me and my bonds, Paul writing, and took joyfully the spoiling of your goods, knowing in yourselves that ye have in heaven a better and an enduring substance. Cast not away therefore your confidence, which hath great recompense of reward." For ye have need of patience, that after ye have done the will of God, ye might receive the promise. For ye a little while, and he that shall come will come, and will not tarry. Second coming of Jesus Christ, when he brings in the new covenant. Now the just shall live by faith, but if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. That's direct inspiration from God. All right, My soul, God speaking, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. The Father is the soul of the Godhead. And he says, I'll have no pleasure in you if you draw back. But we are not of them who draw back unto perdition. Hmm. Interesting because one of the names of the Antichrist is the son of perdition. Very interesting. They draw back unto perdition. They go back to serving the Antichrist. But of them that believe to the saving of the soul. All right. Um, now, here's how it works. Okay. If you're a Jew out there, um, you have a tremendous opportunity right now. Today is uh, April the 26th of 2024. I'm still here. The body of Christ is still here. We have our King James Bible, perfect word of God in English. 
See, the way, let me just explain what the Bible is. God chose the, the language of Hebrew for the Old Testament. Okay? New Testament comes along, God chose Greek. And then to finish the Bible, have it in one amazing volume, God chose English. No book in history can compare with the King James Bible. Not one. Originally called the Authorized Version. Today we kind of nicknamed it the King James Version. This is God's book right here. I've proved it for years and years and years. If you don't agree with it, then shut up. I don't care about your opinions. I really don't. Oh, it's filled with errors. Then go someplace else. It's not filled with errors. You're a liar. You are very much deceived. And I don't have time for your little satanic attacks on God's book on my channel. Okay? I really don't care about you. Your damnation is just if you hate this book and believe that uh, witches can change it magically with the Mandela effect. You're an idiot. Okay? Uh, there's no nice way for me to put that. There really truly isn't. I don't have time for you coming here and playing games with people's souls. What you do with your soul is between you and God. Okay? Um, what shall it profit a man if he gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Well, you are trying to gain the whole world or at least the conspiracy crowd or something out there if you believe in the Mandela effect. Again, the whole study's on this. You know, for years I've been doing this, so I don't really have a lot of patience for people anymore because you can find out the truth. Go to my channel. My videos are free, okay? I don't request uh, that you, when you you're force you, I should say, to, you have to support this ministry and whatever. You, you want to support the ministry? Thank you. God will bless you greatly for that. You don't want to support the ministry? Binge watch things. Get the truth. Understand what I'm saying. I show you the proof. I show you that you can look it up on your own. I, again, with the Mandela Effect thing, I was showing this Bible up here, the revised version, um, beside the King James Bible. This one is from the late 1800s. Original print, right here. And I show you that a lot of the Mandela Effect words, that originally it said wineskins or something, or whatever. Now it says bottles. No, actually, the new versions came out and said wineskins, and the King James always said bottles. Okay, I show you this one in the study. I'm not going to get it down right now. It's there. You can watch it. But... If you are a Jew, okay, you have a great opportunity right now to be saved. It's going to cost you some things. Your family is going to turn against you. Welcome to Christianity. Okay, <laughs> that pretty much happens with everybody. Uh, you might not be able to be uh, in on the inheritance or whatever else. Again, welcome to Christianity. Uh, you're going to be hated and whatever else, you know, maybe a little bit more than a Gentile Christian. I get that because if you're a Jew, uh, becoming a Christian is a very, you know, bad thing to other Jews. But um, God will protect you and God will reward you for that. But if you don't want that, you say, no, I'm not into that. I don't want to be a Christian. No, thank you. Whatever. Okay. Then my suggestion is you better get to Israel as quickly as you can. And you better get a King James Bible and at least have it around and say, you know what? Um... I'm going to just kind of keep this thing here for the right time. It's an end times preparation because things are going to start to happen. And when the body of Christ is caught up, things are really going to accelerate. And then you'll get to see that the New Testament is actually coming to pass. The book of Revelation. And you'll be able to look through it and you'll say, oh, wow, here's this judgment. Here's the seal judgments and the trumpet judgments and the, and the vial judgments. I can see these things happening. Oh, yeah, these two guys. Yeah, it's Moses and Elijah. Yeah, okay, right there, the two witnesses in the book of Revelation. And you'll get to see it. You won't have to live completely by faith. You can actually live by faith and sight at that point in time. It's going to be a lot harder, and you're probably going to end up being, being martyred, you know, for Jesus Christ. But if you want to see the signs, if you want to see the proof, the Jews require a sign. I get it, you know, 1 Corinthians chapter 1. They're coming. Just be patient. All right, um, but if you want to uh, leave your ridiculous, pathetic nonsense of um, Judaism that offers no way to get rid of your sins, um, doesn't give you a personal relationship with God, it's just kind of this sort of a do-good you know, thing in uh, traditions and whatever else. And by the way, if, if you have traditions that are uh, in the Old Testament, you get saved, you put Jesus Christ as your Savior, you don't have to give up your different feast days and things like that. I mean, the Apostle Paul didn't. Uh, he kept a lot of his Jewish ways and things. 
you can you know choose to eat the clean meats or you can have the any meat is fine whatever you want to eat it's up to you again you can continue to live basically as a jew but it's just that you're not looking for your messiah you know he's already here jesus christ so uh just my advice to you out there if you're jewish and um take a stand for jesus christ i take a stand for jesus christ other christians do and uh, it costs us things. We lose jobs. We lose family members. We have people that hate us. People that do violent stuff towards us and whatever else. It'll be worth it all when we get to see Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. So that is going to be it. And I do pray that you take heed to what I've said. And we'll see you in the next video. And as always, as I always like to finish my videos, thank you very much for watching. King James Video Ministries has been faithfully preaching and teaching from God's Word since 2008. Our YouTube channel has never been monetized, and we do not accept money from the lost world because this would violate the Scriptures. King James Video Ministries is supported by saved brethren in accordance with 1 Timothy chapter 5, verses 17-18. through 18. If you have been blessed by our videos, we would ask that you prayerfully consider supporting this ministry financially. You can donate online by visiting www.kingjamesvideoministries.com or by sending a check or money order to King James Video Ministries, P.O. Box 214, Patton, Maine, 04765. Thank you to all who donate to this ministry, and we pray for the Lord's blessing in your lives.